Good evening, friends. My name is Pat Mannon. I am joined tonight by our brother Miguel Garcia. We are coming to you live from Northwest Arkansas. We are so delighted to be with you tonight. We are so glad that you're studying with us. We are studying the theory of premillennialism. We've been uh, doing a series of studies on this topic now for several weeks. And initially, we uh, gave you the theory of premillennialism itself, and I took one complete lesson to, to give you an overview of uh, what the theory is all about, an extensive study of what premillennialists believe uh, will happen in our future, and, and incidentally, probably the near future to them. So I gave you this chart, and we went down this chart looking at the different pieces in this theory. And then in the next study, the second one, I came back in and showed you what was wrong with this theory. We charted out some of the things that were part of the first study. I showed you that this theory involved four different comings of Christ and four different resurrections and four different judgments, that you had to believe in four each of those things in order to believe the theory. of Before it's over, we'll talk about the uh, predictions of time centers down through the years, and we'll do an extensive study of the at least the first half of Matthew chapter 24. And I'll talk to you about uh, modern day time centers and such things as this. And we'll look at those things. So we have a lot to do. Usually when I do a series like this, I don't really give a summary of the beast. But I want you to understand that so many people today are confused about an antichrist about the supposed coming world dictator that will take over the world during the tribulation. And uh, since many hold this view and many others are confused by it, then I've already done a complete study with you on the, on the uh, beast, the identities of them in Daniel and in Revelation. A two-part study already, but I want to come back through tonight and give you a summary of what we've said about this beast. And I'm, I'm hoping in doing this that it's going to help you, it's going to strengthen you, it's going to give you confidence that you can understand the book of Revelation a lot more than perhaps what you thought, that this book makes more sense to you than what it's ever made because it's, uh, it's something that's meant to be understood. And unfortunately, we have all these premillennialists today that come in with their false theories with their false doctrines. Men like Hal Lindsey, who's been doing this since uh, before 1970, this man's been at this over 50 years. This is only one of several books that he wrote. And I showed you some of the contents of this book in one of our earlier studies. This one's called There's a New World Coming. This was written and published and sent out to the, to the world in 1973. And Lindsay has promoted uh, not only this, but uh, many other books as well that he's written on this subject. One called The Rapture, another Countdown to Armageddon, another one, The Late Great Planet Earth. He's written extensively. He's one of the, the great promoters of premillennialism in our day and age. He's getting older right now, but I still see him at times on television. And although he's been wrong in every prediction that he's made, He's still on television, still able to gain audiences that will listen to him and, and uh, lend him some degree of credibility, although I don't know how. Nonetheless, uh, we looked at some of his theories. Let me just remind you of a chart that I put up in front of us of some of the things that Lindsay says will happen uh, during the supposed seven-year tribulation. And I start with this because it involves a supposed future Antichrist that Lindsay in 1973 believed already lived in Europe somewhere and would soon appear in, in, uh, in world history. Now, Lindsay tells us that right after the rapture, a seven-year tribulation will break out on the earth. Seven years. So the rapture, he believes, takes the church off the earth, that Jesus comes invisibly, catches the church, all Christians off the earth at once, raises those that died between Pentecost and the rapture from the dead, and uh, they are taken and judged and 
Their bodies are changed to immortality and they're taken to heaven for seven years. During that seven years, uh, premillennials believe that there will be a great tribulation. They divide it into two sections. The first three and a half years, they believe, is relatively peaceful. The last three in the year, last, last three and a half years are very horrific. During the first three and a half years, here's what Mr. Lindsay says in his book, There's a New World Coming. Here's what he says will occur during this time right after the rapture. He says an antichrist will arise, and he will, he will sign a defense pact with Israel and then become ruler of the world. And I've cited the page numbers in this book where you can read about that. Pages 102, 103. In his book, There's a New World Coming. Lindsay says, Then 144,000 Jews will be converted to Christ at this time. Now the church is gone. The Holy Spirit's no longer on the earth. And yet these 144,000 are going to be converted. And I guess they're not the church. They're called out of the world. They are supposedly saved, but they're not the church. And uh, he believes that's in heaven, and I don't know what these people are called. The 144,000 Jews, he says, are going to convert a vast, innumerable multitude. I don't know what he calls these. Uh, they will be 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams, he says, of these 144,000 Jews that are converted. They convert an innumerable multitude. This is all during the first three and a half years of this seven-year tribulation. Then he says, Moses and Elijah will appear on the earth, and they'll preach for three and a half years. Then he says, number five, the Jews will rebuild their temple during this three and a half years of peace. Now get this, friends. Right after the rapture occurs, Antichrist will sign a defense pact with Israel and guarantee, Lindsay says, their protection as they rebuild their temple there in Jerusalem. The problem is that uh, the Muslims occupy that site where the temple once existed. And uh, there on Mount Moriah where uh, Abraham offered Isaac up as a sacrifice to God, there at that very spot, the Muslims consider this very sacred because they believe that uh, the rock is there that, that uh, Abraham used as an altar when he offered Isaac. They also believe that their prophet, Muhammad, ascended up to heaven from that same rock. And they built a structure over that that's there in Jerusalem to this day called the Dome of the Rock. And this is a very sacred place for Muslims. Uh, probably the second most sacred place next to Mecca would be this Dome of the Rock there in Jerusalem. And this is the site where the temple once stood that was built by Solomon. And of course it would be the spot if the Jews rebuilt a temple, they would build it at this place. Now think about the fact that uh, premillennialists tell us that the rapture could occur at any time, just at any time. Jesus could come secretly and take the church off this earth. And friends, this is so obviously wrong uh, for this reason. If their theory is right, during the next three and a half years, an antichrist has got to come immediately after the rapture. There's no sign of him anywhere on the earth. Secondly, during that three and a half years, the temple's going to have to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And if you tried to build a Jewish temple right now on that spot where the Dome of the Rock is, and you demolished that structure, can you imagine the war that would ensue between every Muslim on earth, every Arab country that's Muslim, would be uh, at war immediately against Israel in trying to take back this spot from them, and we would see a, a war like uh, we've probably never seen. And so this is just nonsense, what's being taught to people today. They want you to believe the rapture can occur at any time. But if it does, there's got to immediately be an antichrist, and the temple's got to be built within three and a half years on this sacred spot. Can you imagine all of this occurring? No one can with any common sense. And so men still propound theories like this, like uh, Lindsay does, and and people simply listen to these teachers 
They don't study their Bibles as they should. They don't check these men, these men, and 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 see if they're taking these things in the context of scriptures, or if they're just uh, making up these theories out of thin air, which is exactly what they're doing. Lindsay goes on to tell us that animal sacrifices are again restored in the temple at Jerusalem. And of course, if that's going to happen, the priesthood will have to be restored. And so it'll have to be figured out. The high priest and the priestly line will have to come out of the tribe of Levi through the specific family of Aaron. Nobody knows those genealogies. They're long gone. And there's never been a Jewish priesthood since uh, the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. There's never been a temple, never been an animal sacrifice, never been a Jewish priest since 70 AD. And indeed there cannot be, but they insist that this will happen. And then they tell us that at the midway point of the tribulation, after three and a half years, that the Antichrist will destroy Babylon, which is a supposed worldwide religion, and that he will rule at the temple in Jerusalem, proclaiming himself to be God. Now this is part of the theory of premillennialism. This is the nonsense that's being taught. And we have people scared to death today by these preachers, by these so-called uh, Bible scholars, who are, are trying to tell them that the coming of an antichrist is imminent, that the rapture is imminent that this temple will be rebuilt and animal sacrifices offered there again, which is, which is just nonsense. God doesn't want animal sacrifices. He would never authorize this, never be behind this. And, uh, and yet this is what people are being told. And uh, folks are believing this. And so that's the, the purpose, the reason for our study I'm trying to help you see that this whole Antichrist hoax, that he is the beast mentioned in Revelation 13, is just nonsense. That Revelation does not teach this. Tonight I want to give you a summary of the two-part study that I've already given you. I would encourage you to go back and look at those two videos and do this two-part study. And maybe even if you've been through it, go through it again and make sure that you have this in your, in your mind and in your knowledge to the extent that you can teach it to people. Because we're not in, <clears throat> we're not in the business of making fun of, of people here. That's not the purpose of this. People are confused. Friends, listen, people need help. They need some understanding of what the Bible says on this. There are so many of them that we can't reach through this venue. But many of you listening that study this and learn these lessons well, well enough to teach them at least, can reach people we cannot even begin to reach. And perhaps you can help them and enlighten them and give them some understanding about what the Bible really teaches. May I remind you, when I took you back through the book of Revelation to uh, dispel some of this false doctrine, I want to remind you of something I showed you that I can't stress enough. And you you need to take this to heart and, and really understand and believe this. Revelation is a book that was given to the first century church to inform them of a soon approaching uh, persecution against the church by the Roman Empire. That's what Revelation is about. Friends, Revelation is not about events that are going to occur in our future. It's just not. And uh, it's a book that was given to tell the first century church that Rome is about to persecute them. And it's couched in symbolic language, in visions that uh, use symbols to portray different ideas and different teaching that the early church could understand. And actually, we can too. Now, Revelation is a difficult book, and I don't want to sit here tonight and and have you think that it's not, but Revelation is still a book that can be understood. We can understand this book if we will really put our minds to it, and we will be seekers of truth if we will come to this book without, a, uh, without preconceived ideas of our own and just let the book tell us what it's all about. That's what we've got to do to ever learn what this book is about. 
And if you bring your own ideas to the book of Revelation, like how Lindsay and others have done, like all premillennial, premillennial people do, you'll never understand Revelation. I'll have you uh, reminded again of Revelation 1 and verse 1, then verse 3. Read these with me here. The first verse in, in the book of Revelation says this, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. The first thing we're told as we open the book is that this book is about things which would shortly, which must shortly come to pass. Now these are not things that would begin to come to pass, but things that would shortly come to pass. The book is about things that would shortly come to pass, not start to come to pass, but shortly come to pass. In verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Those words at hand are the Greek word ingus, and they mean near, and they're translated near in almost every place, either near or at hand, and that's what they mean. Sometimes they're translated nigh, N-I-G-H. <clears throat> Nonetheless, they mean nearness. The time for these things that John is going to tell the church about, that Jesus will inform him about, uh, those things are at hand. The time for them is at hand. Now that's the first chapter. The book is about things that will shortly come to pass. The time for these things is at hand. Verse 22 or chapter 22, I'm sorry, verse 6, Revelation 22, 6. He said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. There it is again. The last chapter tells you that, uh, that God sent his angel to show unto his servants things that must shortly be done. Now verse 10, watch this very closely. He saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And so John is told not to seal his book, that the time for all of these things is at hand. When you go back to the book of Daniel, you know, Daniel's told to seal up his book. He's told the time's not at hand. And uh, yet Daniel's book was to unfold in about 200 years. And since it was not near, since 200 years is still a considerably long time, Daniel's told to seal his book. Let me read to you from Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7. Uh, let me see if it's seven here that I want. Uh, verse four. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. So he tells him to shut up the book. Shut up these words. Seal the book, you see. Uh, because the time was just not going to be. And... Uh, Verse 9, he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So when Daniel gets the same message here, basically, regarding the beast that John got in Revelation, Daniel's told to seal his book. It would be a few hundred years before this happened. But just the opposite, John is told, Don't you seal up the words of this book. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. See, there's the difference. Daniel and John saw the same thing. Daniel's told to seal it. John is told not to seal it. Why? Because John is told that the book concerns things that would shortly come to pass and the time is at hand. Revelation is a book about things that would shortly come to pass. The time would be at hand. Okay? And that's what you need to understand because this is, understand, this is what premillennialists ignore. 
They ignore these time statements. Why? Because they've got a theory. Hal Lindsey's got a theory. He's got an antichrist coming in the future. He's got a seven-year tribulation coming in the future, and he intends to have it. He's got a temple being built in the future. He intends to have that. He's got animal sacrifices being resumed in this temple. He intends to have that. It doesn't matter if it contradicts Revelation. He goes into Revelation and tries to make the things fit the theory that he already has, and that's his problem. Revelation will not fit his theory. And uh, it's not going to fit any theory like this that regards uh, the fulfillment of its contents as, as being yet in the future because the book is about things that would shortly come to pass. Now, I want to take you back to something I didn't give you in the first two parts. I want to take you back to Revelation chapter 12. And then we'll get into chapter 13 where the beast is talked about and, and I'll make a summary for you here tonight. Uh, Revelation 12, I just want to read this chapter with you. It's very interesting. The Bible says in verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Now this is what John saw. He sees a red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. I wonder who this dragon is. Verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So you see, John is seeing a dragon, but it's not really a literal dragon with seven heads and, and such things. It's really the devil. It's Satan. It's that old serpent called the devil and Satan. The dragon's a picture, a symbolic picture of the devil, see. And this woman with child is, is uh, Jesus about to be born here. And uh, so... We read in verse 4 of this dragon that his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. This is Satan's attempt to destroy the Christ child, of course, and to thwart the purpose of Jesus for coming to the earth. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's Christ, see. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more uh, in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God for the power and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and, to the, and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood 
which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now listen, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war when the remnant of her seed, this is the church, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, if you read the American Standard translation of this, it will say, uh, it really speaks of the devil. It comes out of chapter 12 into 13. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with a remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he stood, talking about the dragon, upon the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. So <clears throat> what John is really seeing is Satan's angry. He could not destroy Christ. He could not uh, thwart his purpose in the earth. A war was fought, spiritually speaking. The devil lost. He was cast out. He could no longer accuse us before God because of the blood of Christ and of our obedience to the gospel of Christ and faithfulness to him. And so he's cast out in the earth to make war with the remnant of the woman's seed. And that's the church. And uh, so he, he calls this beast up. He gets him an ally. He calls a beast up out of the sea. This is what he's going to use against the church. This seven-headed, ten-horned beast. This is the Roman Empire. And so what Rome was, was an ally of Satan. It's a, it's a nation that Satan used to try to exterminate Christians and to persecute the church and, of course, to destroy it. Since Satan was not able to destroy Christ and to thwart his purpose, his plan of salvation, his redemption, his sacrifice, his resurrection, since he couldn't stop all of that. He now has but a short time, and uh, John is being told that he will call this beast up out of the sea, that he will use him and another beast out of the earth and uh, deceive the earth and therefore persecute the church. This is something that would shortly come to pass. The time was at hand. Revelation, friends, is this. It is a revelation from Christ warning the church, the first century church, about an imminent persecution by the Roman Empire. That's what it's about. And the message in the book is that if the church will simply be faithful to Christ, though they may die, though it may cost them their lives, they will ultimately have victory through Jesus Christ because the book tells of the defeat of Satan and the defeat of this beast, Rome, and tells us all about its destruction and pictures for us at the end a victorious church who's come through this tribulation with Rome and who has come out victorious in all of her glory. That's what the book's about. And it's about things that would shortly come to pass. Premillennialists have this future theory of this supposed coming world dictator they call an antichrist who they believe is the beast here in Revelation and in the book of Daniel. And they have this very intricate theory woven about all of the things that they believe are going to occur. And that's what I gave you in the first two studies as we studied the theory of premillennialism. And now our task is to come in, having already dispelled some of these uh, false doctrines that are associated with this theory, our task yet before us is to dispel even more of them as we continue through this series. That's what we will be doing. And uh, so tonight I'll try to go back and give you a summary of this beast. I'm going to take you now to chapter 13, and I want us to read about this beast once again and refresh your minds. Then I'll come in and summarize what we're dealing with, all right? Now, <clears throat> Revelation 13 and 1, John said, I stood upon the sand of the sea. And as I told you, the American standard makes it Satan standing there. Satan, he stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. It's like Satan has come to the seashore there and he's calling up his old ally, the beast. This beast that he's going to use against Christians. This is the Roman Empire. I will show you that 
out of the book of Daniel and then again in the book of Revelation because John and Daniel saw this same beast. Let me start again in 13.1. I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his uh, ten horns, on his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man hath an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld, and another beast coming out of the earth. Here's an earth beast now. The other one was out of the sea. I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or six, six, six. Now that's the Revelation chapter 13 on this beast that we've been studying. And I wanted to read that for you again and uh, let you see that text, especially after the context that I've told you about, that the book is about things that would shortly come to pass. Now, when you, when you think about this book, when you think about this beast, uh, when you think about all that we've talked about thus far, there has to be kind of a starting point from which to figure all this out. And the best place I know is to go back to a subject that I studied with you in the third study that we did. It was a study in, out of Daniel chapter 2. We studied the, the kingdom because premillennialists tell us that Jesus came the first time when he was here to set his kingdom up, but he couldn't because the Jews rejected him and they delivered him to the Romans who crucified him. Therefore, he postponed his kingdom, and he'll come again after the seven-year tribulation at the end of the supposed battle of Armageddon, and he will set up a kingdom here on earth then and reign for a thousand years right there on David's throne in the city of Jerusalem. This is what they teach about the kingdom. On the contrary, I showed you that the kingdom came on the first Pentecost day following the resurrection of Christ, in other words, 50 days after the Lord rose from the dead, 
Jesus set up his kingdom. It was a spiritual kingdom. We talked about it. We studied it extensively in Daniel 2 through the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And if you'll remember, Nebuchadnezzar saw this great terrible image. The image had a head of fine gold. His breast and arms were of silver. His belly and thighs of brass. His legs were of iron part and his feet part of iron and part clay. A little stone was cut out of a mountain without hands. It struck the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay and break it to pieces. And eventually this stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I showed you what all of these things were, that the head of gold, that Daniel told him, thou art this head of gold. He was talking about Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And this represented the Babylonian empire, which reigned from uh, 612 to 536 BC. Then there was a second kingdom, and it's represented by the breast and the arms of silver that were on this image. And I showed you in the study that, uh, that this was the Medes and the Persians who came together and formed the Medo-Persian Empire, and it conquered the Babylonians. Then the third kingdom, represented in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, was uh, represented by the belly and thighs of brass. This is Greece, which conquered Medo-Persia. And uh, Greece reigned, from, for example, from 330 to 146 B.C. <clears throat> the legs of iron, the feet part of iron and clay, were the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire. And uh, this uh, empire, of course, conquered Greece and conquered all of the known world at that time. Uh, Rome ruled about everything. And uh, what Nebuchadnezzar had seen in this great terrible image of, in his dream was four future kingdoms, beginning with the one that he now ruled, three others would arise after him. Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome. And the little stone represented the kingdom ruled by Christ. It would strike the image upon the feet of iron and clay. That was Rome. That is, the kingdom would come in the days when Rome ruled. Then, having shown you that, when we studied the beast, in our first study, we went back and we looked at Daniel chapter 7 because Daniel, back in chapter 7, he had a dream also and he had a vision. And let me take you back now to Daniel 7, get you in larger print where you can see this so much easier. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole chapter with you again, but we're going to read part of it. What Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream in that, <coughs> pardon me, in that great terrible image, Daniel saw in a vision that he had there in chapter 7. Daniel said in the first year of Belshazzar, now that's the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. And visions of his head upon his bed then he wrote the sum of the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So Daniel saw four beasts come up out of the sea. He saw the same four kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream back in chapter 2. He saw Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The very same thing that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed about in chapter 2. Daniel sees it now under the figure of four beasts. And how do we know these four beasts are four kingdoms? Well, verse 17 here in Daniel 7, these great beasts which are four are four kings, that is four kingdoms which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 23 Notice this, thus he said the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. See that? The fourth beast will be the fourth kingdom. These beasts are kingdoms. And so what Daniel's seeing is, is the same four kingdoms when he sees these four beasts that Nebuchadnezzar saw back here in his dream. And Daniel will see them under different figures. Whereas, uh, 
Nebuchadnezzar had a head of gold that represented Babylon. Daniel saw a beast rise up. The first one was like a lion. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar in his dream saw the breast and arms of silver on his terrible image. When Daniel, and that was Medo-Persia, Daniel saw it under the figure of a bear. And then in the third kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about, he, he saw the belly and thighs of brass. That was Greece. Daniel sees a leopard for his third kingdom. That's Greece. Whereas Nebuchadnezzar saw legs of iron, feet part of iron and clay, Daniel saw this beast, this iron beast, that had seven heads and ten horns. Another little horn came up that made eleven, and three got uprooted, leaving eight. And uh, Daniel saw the Son of Man go to go with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days and get his kingdom, just like Nebuchadnezzar in his dream saw the little stone cut out of a mountain without hands strike the image, and that was the coming of the kingdom. Both of them saw the coming of God's kingdom. So what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, Daniel saw in chapter 7 in his vision. And this is what I showed you back there, and this is the summary I'll give you tonight. Let's go back to verse 3, verse 4. When Daniel saw these four beasts now come up from the sea, he said the first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings, I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given unto it. That's Babylon. He said, Behold another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side, it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. This is Medo-Persia, represented by the bear. <clears throat> After this, Verse 6, <clears throat> Lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given unto it. I showed you the other night as we studied this beast that uh, it had four wings like a fowl on the back of it. A leopard is fast, but with four wings, it's very swift. And that's a picture of, of Greece under Alexander the Great who conquered the world by the time he was age 33. The beast also had, or this leopard had four heads. <clears throat> when Nebuchadnezzar died, remember, his kingdom split four different ways, and these four heads represent the four divisions of Greece under his generals. And uh, you had Thrace and Macedonia and Syria and Egypt. Greece, the Grecian Empire, was split up into four different major parts. So that's the reason for the four heads. These, of course, were, <coughs> pardon me, friends, these were the uh, four generals that uh, that ruled these four different kingdoms. You were you had Lysimachus and Cassander and Ptolemy, and, and you had Seleucus, and these were the four generals. So we talked about all of that. But the main thing that we focused on was this fourth kingdom because this is the one John saw in Revelation. John says in verse 7, here it is, here's the fourth one. After this I saw in the night visions, behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. I considered the horns. Behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up with the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So he sees this seven-headed beast with ten horns. He sees another little horn come up on, among those ten. That made eleven but he saw three get uprooted, and 11 minus three leaves eight. When John sees this thing in Revelation, he will see eight instead of 11. I'll show you all this in just a moment. We dropped on down now to where Daniel was visited by an angel, and uh, he was made to understand uh, what this vision that he'd seen meant. John said that uh, I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, 
whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Uh, then he says, 22, till the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. <clears throat> now watch this, friends. This is the fourth beast, and here it is in 23. We're told who it is. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it in pieces. All right, that's not, that's not hard to understand, is it? The fourth beast that, that Daniel saw is the fourth kingdom upon earth, diverse from all others. That's wrong because you see you had Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And that's what Daniel saw, lion, bear, leopard, and an iron beast. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and now Rome. The fourth kingdom, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. This iron beast with seven heads and ten horns is the Roman Empire. And that's what I, I, I showed you back in Revelation 13. Satan standing upon the uh, seashore calling up an ally to use against the church. And when he did, he called up this beast out of the sea. And what did it have? Seven heads, ten horns. See what I'm talking about? That's what Daniel saw. And that's the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom on earth. And that's Rome. So when John saw this come up out of the sea, he saw the emergence of Rome. He saw Rome coming pictured as a seven-headed Ten-horned beast, see? And then he saw uh, he saw a lot of things about that beast. He saw one of his horns, one of his heads get wounded to death, and he saw that healed. Uh, he saw in any number of things. He saw a beast come up out of the earth. We want to know what that is. He said he saw, uh, he saw the beast have a number. It was 666. We want to know what that means a number, a mark that everyone had to take that wanted to buy and sell. Otherwise, they were persecuted or killed. Over in chapter 17, he will see a harlot. We want to talk about her. I've already identified her for you. We'll do that again briefly. He also saw in Revelation 17 this same beast, but he saw in regard to it a beast that was and is not and yet is. We want to identify that. He saw the head on that beast get wounded to death, and then he saw that deadly wound healed. We talked about that. I'll remind you of what that was all about. We have several things now to identify. This beast out of the sea, this sea beast, is the Roman Empire. And uh, I've showed you it's the fourth kingdom on earth. Now let me show you verse 24 here in Daniel 7 before we leave Daniel. The ten horns out of this kingdom. Remember that beast that he saw, that fourth kingdom. It had ten horns on it. He said the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. If the, if the beast is Rome, and it is, and the ten horns out of that kingdom are ten kings that will arise, these are kings that rule Rome, right? I mean, that's not hard, is it? Let me read that again. The ten horns out of this kingdom, the fourth kingdom, Rome, are ten kings that shall arise. These are the Caesars. And so I took you through a list of these. Now he says that uh, there are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, another king. That's that eleventh horn. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Three will get uprooted. Ten horns, another little horn, and three horns get uprooted, leaving eight. So I took you to uh, Rome and to these horns, and I told you these are the Caesars. 
You see, they were, some of them had come and gone when John wrote, some were still ruling, and some would rule yet. There was Augustus Caesar. He ruled from 31 to 14 A.D. Tiberius from 14 to 37 A.D. Caligula uh, reigned from 37 to 41. Claudius, 41 to 54 A.D. Nero, 54 to 68. When Nero died, three tried to take his place. The first one was Galba. He lasted seven months in the years 68 and very early 69. He got uprooted. He got assassinated. After his death, Otho tried to rule. Otho lasted 95 days in an earlier part of 69. And when Otho was assassinated, Vitellius tried to take the rule. He lasted eight months in the year 69. Finally, a man by the name of Vespasian Caesar came along, and he did get the throne, and he ruled 10 years from 69 to 79 A.D. When he died, his son Titus began to reign, and he just reigned a short time from 79 to 81. Now, these are the 10 horns. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero. That's five. Three get uprooted. Galba, Otho, Vitellius. That's eight. Vespasian and Titus. That's 10. Then a little horn came up. This is Domitian, who was Titus's brother. When Titus died in 81, Domitian, uh, he took over and ruled from 81 to 96. He's the real villain that John's writing about. He's that little horn that had the mouth speaking great things. He's the little horn that persecuted the saints and wore them out until God finally judged him. And he's the one that, that uh, John is being warned about that's coming to persecute the church. He's the head on that beast that's going to be so terrible. He's pictured as a horn here in Daniel, and he'll be pictured as a head by John over in Revelation 17. Now, these are things that I showed you the other night. You see, <clears throat> Daniel was just seeing world history unfold right in front of him. He saw a fourth beast. He said, that's the fourth kingdom on earth. That's Rome. He said, the ten horns out of that kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. He saw the Caesars. He saw a little, another little horn come up. That was Domitian. He saw three get uprooted. Galba, Otho, Vitellius. That's exactly what happened in history. Now, John will see this beast later. When he sees it, we'll talk about this over in chapter 17. John will see the first five have already fallen. He just ignores these three uprooted because they've already been uprooted. John is writing in the time of Vespasian. So Vespasian is, will be the one that is, and then there'll be another one come, and then there'll be an eighth one. He ignores the three that got uprooted. Daniel was looking at the future. He couldn't ignore them because they were coming. But when John writes, they've already come and gone. And so he just ignores them and speaks of eight instead of 11, see. Because ultimately, this beast, Rome, would have these 10 kings. Another one would come making 11, but three would get uprooting, uprooted, leaving eight. And when John sees it here, he just writes about the eight and ignores the three that are uprooted. They're seeing the same thing. That's what I showed you then during the last two studies is that the beast that came up out of the sea in Revelation 13 is the Roman Empire. And we did an extensive study of that, and I showed you that. Uh, and then we made a little comparison between what Daniel saw and John saw just to seal this up and to confirm it that indeed this is Rome. When Daniel saw this sea beast, this fourth beast, he saw four beasts come up from the sea. John saw a beast rise out of the sea. Daniel said that his beast was like a lion. John said that the beast he saw had the mouth of a lion. Daniel said the second beast was like a bear. John said the beast he saw had the feet of a bear. Daniel said that the third beast he saw was like a leopard. John said the beast he saw was like a leopard. Daniel said his beast had, this fourth one had 10 horns. That's wrong. Uh, John said that the beast he saw had 10 horns. 
Daniel said that beast had a mouth speaking great things, blasphemies. John said in Revelation 13, this beast uh, had a head, he had a mouth speaking great things, just like, just like Daniel's. You see, they saw the same beast. And we said the sea beast, the one that Satan called up out of the sea there in Revelation 13, that's the Roman Empire. Now that leaves some other things that you and I need to identify. And I mentioned these a moment ago. We identified the sea beast as Rome. Then I took you through in the second study the identity of these other six things that we wanted to identify. There was an earth beast in Revelation 13. And I showed you that was religious Rome, that this beast comes up out of the earth and it's got two horns like a lamb and speaks as a dragon. That's Revelation 13, 11. And I, I told you that this beast here is religious Rome. This second beast is Rome again. It's just pictured as promoting emperor worship because it promotes worship of the first beast that had the deadly wound and was healed. <clears throat> and so this earth beast is religious Rome promoting empire and Caesar worship. And that's what Rome demanded. And uh, then we had a head that was wounded to death on that first beast. Remember that? So I took you back and and showed you these Caesars once again. When Rome began to rule and it uh, conquered the world, Caesar was the fifth one of these, or Nero was the fifth one of these Caesars. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero. Nero claimed to be God. He claimed to be divine. God here on earth and demanded worship. Nero persecuted Christians. He had many Christians crucified, many of them slain and burned. Nero, if you'll remember, I told you, uh, set up crosses down the streets of Rome, and he crucified Christians on those crosses. He poured oil on their bodies. He lit their bodies on fire. Why? because at night he used them for human street lights. He raced chariots up and down the street using the body, burning bodies of, of Christians as street lamps for chariot races. He just brutally persecuted the church. When John gets this revelation, the church remembers Nero. They suffered under that persecution. But what the Lord wants uh, the saints to know is that this head that's been wounded to death is going to be healed. Nero is the head wounded to death. When Nero died, the persecution from the empire ceased. You see, Nero was the first to persecute Christians. And when he died, that persecution ceased for a time. Now, there was persecution, but not an empire policy of it, and certainly not like Nero persecuted. And so the, the head then that was wounded to death caused the persecution to cease. <clears throat> but remember, this head that was wounded to death will get healed. That is, John is being told another Caesar is going to come back, and he's going to be just like Nero. And he's going to start this persecution against you all over again. He's referring to Domitian. I will show you that in due time. But that's what I took you through. In those first two studies, I showed you that Domitian is the fulfillment of that head wounded to death that gets healed. In other words, it's, it's almost like Nero rose from the dead uh, in the person of Domitian. Because when Domitian came along to rule from 81 to 96, he persecuted just like Nero did. And that's the significance of the head wounded to death and uh, later getting healed. We'll talk about that further in just a minute. <clears throat> so what I showed you was simply this, that the sea beast was the Roman Empire. The earth beast is religious Rome persecuting, or excuse, excuse me, promoting worship of the emperor and of the empire. The head wounded to death is Nero, who was the first one of these uh, Caesars to 
persecute the church as a policy, and he per persecuted it severely. He burned Rome, he blamed it on Christians, and he persecuted our brothers and sisters back in the first century. The church, when John got the book of Revelation, was well aware of that. They had lived through that persecution. It was horrible. Now, John's being told it's coming back. There's another head on this beast uh, that will uh, start this persecution all over again. Then uh, the number 666. We read there in our reading in Revelation earlier tonight. I took you into Revelation 13 and to the statements there that we found in the book about this, this number 666. Let's go back and look at this just a moment. We're told of the earth beast regarding this first beast, the sea beast. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. <clears throat> Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Six, six, six. Now, uh, when you read Hal Lindsey's remarks, out of his uh, book, There's a New World Coming, what he will tell you is that this number 666, he really believes that it's uh, an invisible tattoo that everybody's going to have to take in order to buy or sell. He believes when this Antichrist comes, this so-called world dictator who he thinks is the beast, that you will have to take a number. He really believes that's your social security number. He says so in the book. And uh, I don't urge you to buy this book, but that's nonetheless what he says. Lindsay says that your social security number will either be tattooed invisibly on your forehead or in your right hand, that it will be visible only under ultraviolet light, and that if you wish to buy, buy or sell, you've got to have this number. And... Uh, I mean, that's, that's what he promotes. We have people now telling us today that it's some UPC symbol that's uh, uh, put on our, our flesh. Others think it's a computer chip that will be put under the skin. There's all kinds of theories. But if you understand the book of Revelation, you know that this beast here is the ancient Roman Empire, that it has nothing to do with UPC symbols nothing to do with invisible tattoos under ultraviolet light, has nothing to do with computer chips. The early church wouldn't have understood anything about it. They didn't know anything about ultraviolet lights and uh, such things. They didn't know anything about uh, UPC symbols and computer chips. This would have made no sense to them, but the book was written to them to warn them of things that would shortly come to pass and the time was at hand. And I've shown you the, the beast here out of the sea is the fourth beast, the fourth kingdom upon earth, and that's Rome. We're dealing with Rome, the Roman Empire of John's day. So whatever this 666 is, it has to do with Rome. The head wounded to death, Rome. Uh, the harlot in Revelation 17, Rome, the earth beast, Rome. The beast that was, is not, and yet is, Rome. The head, wound, uh, the head wounded to death that got healed, Rome. All of this is about Rome. You see, all of these identities that we're looking for are associated with the Roman Empire of John's day. Because Revelation is couched in symbols, and written about things that would shortly come to pass. That's why John saw a seven-headed beast. That's what he saw, but what he really saw was the Roman Empire under that symbol, under that figure, see. And the 666 then has to be associated with Rome. Friends, it's really that simple. Just keep in mind these, these uh, time statements that I've told you again and again 
are critical to the understanding of this book. The reason Hal Lindsey doesn't understand Revelation is that he brings his own theory to the book, and tries to make the book fit his theory, and it won't fit it. You cannot approach Revelation this way. You have to come to the book, and you have to see what it is telling you, because it has the truth. And uh, that's what we've tried to do in this study, is simply show you what Revelation is all about. It's all about Rome and its persecution against the first century church, all right? Now, <clears throat> I took you into a study then of this 666. I want to get to that right quick, and we need to move on. I took you back and showed you here that there was a practice that really started in ancient Babylon called dramatria. Gematria. You might call it dramatria, however you pronounce it. G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A. Uh, and over in Babylon, the, the Jews uh, often played this game. It was the use of all the letters in a, in a word uh, to form a numerical value from those letters. Let me, let me put it this way. Ancient alphabets, the letters in ancient alphabets had a numerical value. Here's the Hebrew alphabet over here on the left starting with a left and down here to Ta and on to uh, 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 Saudi. Uh, it gets a one, two, three, four, five, etc. And each one of those letters, and, and here's the characters, the letters in the Hebrew alphabet, they have a numerical value. Greek has the same thing. Uh, you have alpha through omega, and then they've added another, called, another letter called Samsi, that has a value of 900. <clears throat> and each one of these Greek characters here, uh, letters, here's the alphabet, each one of them has a numerical value. Uh, so if you spell a name in Greek, for example, uh, you can take each letter in that name and see what its value is numerically. And when you add the sum of all those different letters, they're numbers it will give you a total number. For example, uh, Jesus' name in Greek totals 888. Here it is. I put it in lowercase. I put it in all capitals. Christ's name in Greek, the name Jesus, Iota, Eta, Sigma, Omicron, Upsilon, Sigma. And the Iota gets a value of 10, the Eta, 8, the Sigma, 200, Omicron, 70, Upsilon, 400, Sigma 200. When you add all of those numbers, the Lord's name totals 888 in Greek. I just, uh, I'm using that for an example. Now, uh, if you took uh, the names of, of other different things associated with the Roman Empire, and uh, those letters, either in Hebrew or Greek, have numerical equivalents, then you come up with a value for each one of them. And there are different things that will total 666. I'll show you that. I showed you a, an example here that I made up. This is just made up. These others are legitimate. This is one I made up for purposes of illustration. <clears throat> I took our English alphabet, A through Z, and I gave A uh, a value of 1, B, 2, C, 3, D, 4, E5, etc. I got down to J, it gets 10, K's 20, L's 30, M's 40. I came on down and gave all of them values. <clears throat> then I took the name Brother John D. Doe. And when you take the B and Brother, that B has a value of 2. R down here has a value of 90. And then the O has a value of 60. And I just took Brother. And when you take the word brother, uh, using this uh, illustration of mine here, it'll total 455. John, when you total the value of J-O-H-N in each one of those values, they total 128. D totals 14, D-E-E. -E. Doe totals 69, D-O-E. You have 4, 60, and 5, 69. When you add 455, 128, 14, and 69, they total 666. In other words, using this illustration, Brother John D. 
Doe totals 666. Uh, I showed you that the first six letters of the Roman Empire, or Roman, excuse me, not the Roman Empire, the first six Roman numerals, total 666. We have I equals 1, V equals 5, X equals 10, L equals 50, C equals 100, D equals 500. When you total those, they total 666. That doesn't mean anything. It's just that that's what the first six Roman numerals total. But there's an M, and it has a value of 1,000. So if you put the M in here, of course, it totals 1,666. And uh, I'm just showing you that for purposes. Then, having used this, this uh, illustration with you, I showed you that there are three different possibilities for the number 666 that, to me, have more possibility than than anything else that I've seen. And uh, let me show you what those three are again and remind you. Then I'll show you which one I favor. <clears throat> I told you this 666 associated with the Roman Empire, everything is. <clears throat> and once you define the sea beast as Rome, then the other things connected with it, like the head wounded to death and the 666 and the earth beast and all of these other things, they have to be associated with Rome because they're part of the beast, see. <clears throat> I showed you that there's the word Latinos, Latinos, and it is the, uh, the word for the Latin or Roman Empire. And here it is in Greek, Lambda, Alpha, Ta, Epsilon, Iota, Nu, Omicron, Sigma. And when you take the value of each one of those letters in the name Latinos, they total 666. In other words, the Roman Empire, the Latin or Roman Empire, totals 666 itself. I think that's very interesting. That's a possibility, you see, for the identity of the beast. But we're told it's the number of a man. And uh, so I'm not as apt to adopt that as the meaning of it. There's a second one, however, Caesar Augustus. The Caesar Augustan beast. And uh, Caesar Augustus was an official designation for every one of these Caesars. And uh, they were emperors. And the name Caesar Augustus here in, in uh, Greek is Kappa Alpha Iota Sigma Alpha Rho Sigma Epsilon Beta Alpha Stigma Omicron Nu. And when you total each one of those letters and their value, they total 666. So Caesar Augustus will total 666. That's a great possibility for the identity of the beast, that it is Caesar Augustus. But this beast had a head wounded to death that was healed. And this is the one the earth beast was causing people to worship. The head wounded to death that got healed. And we said the head wounded to death was Nero. It so happens that in Hebrew, Nero's name in Hebrew, uh, Nun, Resh, Va, Nun, Kof, Samak, Resh, when you take the Hebrew equivalents, 50, 200, 6, 50, 100, 60, 200, it totals 666. And I told you in, in our second study, I believe that Nero was is the 666 being referred to in Revelation 13. And I think for this reason, though Domitian is the beast that's coming, uh, that's when the, the head that was wounded to death will be healed. Uh, Domitian's name is not given to us in these symbols. Maybe to protect the saints, I don't know, but Nero's name would remind them. In other words, the church is being told that the number of the beast is 666, that this is Nero. In other words, they're being told another Nero is coming. Nero, the head wounded to death, is going to be healed. And so John is simply given the name of Nero here to suggest to the church that this fellow, that Nero is coming again in the person of Domitian. Not the old Nero, but the new Nero. And in fact, in history, Domitian, when he came, was called a limb of bloody Nero. Domitian claimed to be Lord God. 
he demanded worship. And uh, he persecuted just like Nero did. He was called a limb of bloody Nero, just like Nero. The head wounded to death was healed. So I think Nero is named when Domitian is suggested. And that's what I believe that John's given the church. So I told you of the three, which were Latinos, the Roman Empire, uh, Caesar Augustus, the name for all the Caesars, or Nero Caesar, that uh, I thought of the three, Nero fit everything a little better. You're welcome to your view on that. This is really, until I see further evidence, what I'm convinced of at this time. So I give you that for your consideration. So we said now so far, the sea beast is the Roman Empire. The earth beast is religious Rome that's promoting emperor worship. We said the head wounded to death was when Nero died and the persecution ceased. We've said the number 666 refers to Nero, who will come again in the person of Domitian. Now, the fifth thing that we want to identify, <clears throat> we have a hearted in Revelation 17. I'm going to take you there right quickly. We're not going to spend long on this harlot, but I'll tell you a little bit about her. We will identify her very quickly. Lindsay tells us that this Babylon, this woman, this harlot, is a coming worldwide religion. That's just nonsense. That's not what Babylon is at all. That's not what this woman is at all. How does Lindsay get that idea? Because he, uh, he comes to the book with his mind made up. He's got a world religion that's going to come along and unite the world during the tribulation. And that's what he tries to make this harlot. But this harlot is not a future uh, one world religion. It's just not. Chapter 17, 1, John's told there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Notice this whore sits on many waters, friends. Now look at verse 15. He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth, are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. These waters are not waters at all. He saw a whore sitting on many waters. But what are the waters? They're, they're peoples, nations, or multitudes, nations, and tongues. Rome ruled the nations, you see. And so this harlot is said to sit upon many waters. With whom, the, this woman, with whom, the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made wine with or drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the wilderness, and the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Now she's riding the beast. Who is the beast? The Roman Empire. The woman sits on the beast. Who might she be? She's not some worldwide religion, as Lindsay tells us. She sits on the beast. What is she? She's the capital city of Rome. That's who she is. She's pictured as a seductive whore. Why? Because she has seduced the nations with her commerce. She has made the kings of the earth wealthy through their trade with her. And uh, in that sense, they are said to have committed fornication with her. She persecutes Christians because that's what the city of Rome did. That's where many Christians died, see. And so she's pictured as a whore sitting on a beast. He saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. <clears throat> and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. You, you see, she's, she's royalty. She rules. She's got purple and scarlet. She's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She kills Christians, see. That's what the city of Rome did. 
And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. He means he marveled. The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I'll tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which had the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So for a time it was, then it, it was not or is not. Then it comes back. It ascends out of the bottomless pit and goes into perdition. And uh, verse 9, <clears throat> Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads, that is on this beast, are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Not only does this woman sit on many waters, she sits on seven mountains. What city sits on seven hills? Rome. The seven hills of Rome. Look them up. Google that. Just Google the seven hills of Rome, the seven mountains of Rome. <clears throat> and you'll find that Rome indeed sits on seven hills. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Okay. Now when we come down to show you we're right, verse 18, John's going to be told who the woman is. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. What city reigned over the kings of the earth in John's day? Rome. And the reason that she's a city, you see, she sits on the beast. She's the capital city. That's why she rides the beast. She sits on it. She sits on seven hills, see, seven mountains. This is the city of Rome. <clears throat> Pictured as a seductive whore, and that's, she's made all the kings and merchants across the earth rich. Verse 3, when she falls, John is told that all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So they've traded with Rome and she made them rich and now she's to be destroyed. And they're in grief about it. Not over her, but because they lose their money. Now there's nobody to buy their goods. You see, this is the fall of Rome picture. All right. All right. So there's the identity of the harlot. I told you that these are associated with Rome. That was not a world religion. We're told that the Woman is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That's Rome, see. Isn't that simple? There's nothing hard about this. And yet Lindsay's come in here trying to tell us that that uh, that Babylon, a worldwide religion, Babylon will unite most all the world. He cites Revelation 17, verse 1 to 5 that we just read. Nonsense, see. Because he comes with his mind made up. And that's why you can't believe these guys and why you can't believe premillennialism. This is all nonsense. It's all false doctrine. These are false theories of men, just pulled out of, out of air. We have two more things to identify. <clears throat> One of them is a beast that was, is not, and yet is. Let's do this very quickly. Revelation 17 again. It's where we read of this beast that was, is not, and yet is. Verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend down the bottomless pit and go into perdition. He says that uh, all the world will wonder when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So we got a beast that was, it is not, yet it is. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is. And the other's not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Remember the Caesars that I showed you earlier? There are seven kings, these seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There's the seven heads are seven mountains. They are also seven kings. And John is told five are fallen. 
Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Caesar. Five are fallen. He said one is. So John ignores the three that got uprooted. They're insignificant. They never gained the throne. So he says one is. That's Vespasian. So when John wrote the book, Vespasian was ruling. He's the one that is. Five are fallen. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero. One is Vespasian. Then he said, the others not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. That's Titus. He reigned from eighty, from 79 to 81, just a short space. Exactly, exactly what happened in history. Uh, so Titus had not yet come. When Vespasian died, Titus came, and he reigned a short space. Then he says, the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth, that's Domitian, and is of the seven. He's a Caesar just like these other seven, and he goes into perdition or destruction. The beast that was is not, and yet is. He's the eighth. He is Domitian. He's that little horn back in Daniel 11 that came up where three got uprooted. And when John saw him, he's the eighth one instead of the eleventh because three are uprooted. And uh, so this is Domitian. How is he the beast that was, is not, and yet is? Here it is. When Nero ruled, Nero persecuted the church. The beast was, that is, Rome persecuted. When Nero died, the beast is not. Even though Rome ruled, it didn't persecute like Nero did. <clears throat> so the beast is said to be, is not. It doesn't affect the church like it once did. And yet the beast is, he's coming back. That head that was wounded to death gets healed. And incidentally, this is the meaning of the head wounded to death healed. When Nero died, the head on that beast was wounded to death and the persecution ceased. When Domitian began to rule, the head wound was healed because Nero, it was as if Nero came back in Domitian and began the persecution. That's what John is being warned about. So the beast was when Nero ruled, is not when Nero died, yet is when Domitian comes back and starts persecuting like Nero did. And then that leads us to the seventh thing, Domitian is the head wounded to death that was healed, the one being warned about. He's the little horn of Daniel chapter seven, all right? So now we've identified seven things for you. The, the sea beast, the beast out of the sea, Roman Empire. The earth beast, religious Rome, promoting, promoting worship of the emperor. The head wounded to death, Nero. The persecution ceased when that head was wounded to death. Uh, 666, Nero, uh, soon to be revived in Domitian. The harlot, Revelation 17, the capital city, Rome. The uh, beast that was, is not, and yet is. That's Domitian. Uh, he was when Nero ruled. He is not when Nero was killed or died. He yet is when Domitian comes back to reign because he starts the persecution again. The head wounded to death, Domitian. Nero persecuted. The head was wounded to death, but when it's healed, that's Domitian because he starts the persecution all again. I told you back when we did this study, you could write Rome all over these identities. That's what Revelation's about. Satan, John saw that dragon on the sand of the seashore call up a beast out of the sea. He called the Roman Empire, this seven-headed, ten-horned beast that he would use to persecute the remnant of the seed of that woman that fled to the wilderness from, from the serpent. And of course, that was the church. And Satan went out to make war with the church when he couldn't destroy Christ. He's still at war with the church. He always will be till the coming of the Lord Jesus. Revelation is, is meant to warn the early church of this persecution. Now, friends, listen. You and I may have coming persecutions in the future. The world may suffer greater persecution than what we read about in the book of Revelation. But what I'm telling you tonight is this. 
revelation and the beast that's in it is not some future world dictator referred to in scripture as the Antichrist. He is just not. That's made up by premillennials. There's no truth in it. We may have a world dictator sometime that persecutes the world. I don't know. But he's not the beast mentioned in Revelation 13 or in Revelation 17 or in Daniel 7. That's been fulfilled long ago in ancient Rome. And I want you to understand that. This idea of this rapture, this seven-year tribulation, we're going to deal with that too. And I'll show you that this is nonsense, that the premillennials do not have seven years for a tribulation. That's next week. Next week, I study with you Daniel chapter 9, specifically verses 24 to 27. That's the only place in the Bible that premillennials can find seven years for their great tribulation. I'll show you why they can't find it in those verses, because that prophecy has already been fulfilled. That's the subject of our next study. This whole theory of premillennialism is nonsense. I want you to know the truth. I don't want these preachers scaring you. I want you to believe in Christ and obey Christ and serve Christ, not out of fear of some, of some crazy dictator that's coming or some future seven-year tribulation where you're scared out of your wits. You need to serve Christ out of love because he loved you and died for you, not because you're afraid of something coming in the future. And so we'll talk about this theory more in the, in the coming studies that are still yet to be part of this entire series. As Miguel and I leave you tonight, we thank you from our hearts for studying with us tonight, for being part of these series of studies. We hope you'll continue to join us and tell others about these studies. And remember, these studies stay up on our website. You can go back and review them time and time again. You can share them with your friends and others. Ask them to view this series. Ask them to view the whole series, not just parts that they can understand the entire picture of this. And it's going to take some time on their part, but I think as you're seeing, we'll try to make it worth your, worth your time. Thanks again for studying with us, and we'll look forward, God permitting, to seeing you next week. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Have a wonderful next week to come. And as we leave you tonight, may it be a blessed night for you. Good night, friends. May God bless you.